Michigan ranks third in the nation in apple production, so it makes sense that folks are going to be making cider in Michigan. And in this here episode, we're going to be looking at three specific cideries, and it's all about spotlighting the terroir of what is known as Top of the Mitten. Hey, 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 my name is Rhea Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. We'll be getting to that featured presentation on Michigan terroir in just a little bit. And one thing you should know about it, it's actually a presentation, a sensory presentation that was pre-recorded at CiderCon 2022. And CiderCon is an annual trade conference put on by the American Cider Association. And I was lucky enough to be able to attend this tasting session with folks from an area known as Top of the Mitten in Michigan. So just think for a minute, ge- geography-wise, where Michigan is, it's kind of like in the middle of the U.S., and it has a shape like a mitten like a mitten that you would wear during the winter. And so top of the mitten is the northern section of Michigan. So we'll be heading there shortly. But first, a wee bit of news from out and about in Ciderville. Coming up in the next couple months, I'm going to be recording a session with a technician at Fermentis, all on yeast and fermentation. And this means that you, dear Ciderville, have an opportunity to get involved. You could send questions, those kind of questions that really have been like nagging and and left unanswered or something you've been just wondering about. Any question. I mean, it doesn't have to be super nerdy. It could just be a baseline question about yeast. What What is it? How do you explain that to people? I mean, I really have my own explanation on that, but... Wouldn't it be cool to hear a technician explain what what is yeast and how do you explain it to folks coming to your cider bar? I think it would. I always like to hear new new definitions. And the folks there at Fermentis, they they're cool people. I mean, they are helping keep this podcast on the air. So that says something about them right there. And they also have select cider yeast cultures just for you, depending upon what you want your finished product to be. So you could check it all out at Fermentis by going to Fermentis.com. And while you're looking at their yeast selections, you could also send a little email my way to info at ciderchat.com with your question about yeast. So be able to ask the cool people at Fermentis and help you and I get our fermentation right. Mr. Quince, can you give us a little bit of a drum roll for this next segment? Roger that. After two long years, I could finally say we are going on a cider tour. And we're headed to France. The Talking Palms and I may be practicing French, but you don't need to speak French to be on this tour because we have a full-time translator throughout the entire trip. Plus, many of the makers that we visit love to practice their English with you. Très bien, Ria. Très bien. That's perfect, Perry. You got it. Merci. This Saturday tour is scheduled September 18th through the 24th, and we'll be meeting with eight makers throughout the week, and we'll also be having dinner with two of them, providing an opportunity for everyone to get to know each other, to raise a glass, and to feast on both the sights, the sound, the terroir, in your glass with some of the world's best and finest cider makers. Hooray! We'll be visiting some of the famous cideries, such as Domaine de Pont. And at Domaine de Pont, we will have a very special tour with the master himself, my friend Etienne de Pont. And we'll also be visiting another local cidery, Domaine Marois. And that is led by Anthony Marois. And I'll tell you, if you have not had his ciders, you are really in for a treat. But don't tell that to Eric Bordelais, who we also will be visiting and have a very special cider dinner 
with Monsieur Bordelais himself. Besides being in Pays d'Oge, which is one region of Normandy that is very apple-centric, we'll also be visiting the region known as Donfronté, where the Perry Pears reign. Indeed, Ria, indeed. <laughs> That's right, Perry Pear. And there we'll visit the Musée de Poré and also visit the Pacoré family. And of course, this time around, we're going to Bretagne or Brittany. But first, we head to Mont Saint Michel, a World Heritage UNESCO site. So there is a lot happening on this tour, and yet you're going to have some free time to relax and enjoy the sight, sounds, and smells of France. Yes, there is a glass of cider waiting for you in France on this tour. So if you would like to come along with me and other fun-loving cider fans, send an email today to info at ciderchat.com. We're going to France. Ah, bien tout. Up next, we're heading to our featured presentation, which was pre-recorded at CiderCon 2022. This is a sensory tasting, and the name of the workshop is Top of the Mitten, High Latitude Ciders from Northern Michigan. It was described as a guided sensory exploration of ciders from near or north of the 45th parallel. We'll explore the impact of the Great Lakes, the soil, orchard history, and more of these ciders from Northern Michigan. Now on a podcast, you might be thinking, well, what am I going to get out of a, a sensory tasting where I don't have the ciders in hand? Well, first of all, you could probably order any of these ciders online and then follow up. But short of that, you, you really can't actually get quite a bit out of a sensory tasting because you're hearing on how they are describing the taste of the ciders, and they're also talking about the process for making it. So I know that there are, once again, pearls of apple wisdom to be gleaned from this episode. And with Nicole Laban being the moderator, well, you know you're in for a treat. Nicole Laban is based in Vermont. She worked at Farnham Hill with Steve Wood for many years, uh, like over 20 years, and then more recently worked at another cidery in Vermont, Silo. But nowadays, she's more of a consultant to cider makers. I've had the pleasure of judging with her on a couple of occasions now, and it's She's just a delight as a human, without a doubt, but her, her stretch of cider knowledge is really quite remarkable, and she's very approachable. So I really want to recommend her and her consulting business, which is called La Nose. <laughs> you got to love it, um, and, and to check that out. So that's something to look forward to. And then we have two cider makers, because one of the cider makers at the last minute couldn't attend, and that is Ryan Ulbrich from Left Foot Charlie. Uh, sadly, he couldn't make it, but his ciders were there. And then we have Dan Young of Tandem Cider, and I believe that Dan is currently on the board of the American Cider Association. I've known Dan for a really long time because he is from Massachusetts, not too far from where I live now, and it was a local yokel and then opened up a brewery called The People's Pint, which is still still around in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And uh, I actually used to bartend there uh, for about a year. So fun stuff with Dan. And it's really cool to see him with the cidery now that he and his wife, Nikki, run. And then there's Dan Stepanski of Presque Isle Farm. And this is a new cidery that just, I think they just started rolling out cider about two years ago. And they're based in Posen, Michigan. So also at the top of the mitten in Michigan, but on the eastern side of the Michigan versus Left Foot Charlie and Tandem Cider are on the west side of the mitten. So same kind of terroir, but it'll be interesting for you to hear on how they're sourcing their fruit here. And um, I was really wowed by what Dion's doing. I haven't had any of their ciders there he and his wife Molly make and their farmer. So you're going to hear a little bit of that story. And he was kind enough to meet up with me later and give me two bottles of their cider, one being the Kingston Black, and that's a single varietal cider, and a Golden Russet Cider, which it was also a single varietal cider. So that was just the Kingston Black in one bottle and the Golden Russet in another. So I'm really curious about the Golden Russet. And um, yeah, I fell in love with one of his ciders and I I kept on 
pouring <laughs> more in my glass and walked out with a glass from that workshop because I didn't want to let it go. And at the end of this episode, I'll let you know which one really wowed me. So without further delay, let's head next to this seminar all about the cideries at top of the mitten. And we'll begin by hearing from Nicole Laban. And that means that this is a very good time for you to grab a glass and join this chat. So first I wanted to know about you guys. Are any of you here from Michigan? Okay, yay. All right. Um, but you're, you're sort of proving my, my hypothesis, which is that probably a lot of the people that are here haven't had the opportunity to have a lot of Michigan ciders. And the good news is that Michelle told me that this was a short amount of time, and so we had to hurry up, which means that we're not going to talk very much, and you guys get to drink. So um, I introduce to you Dion Stepanski from Presqu'il um, Cidery, and Dan Young from Tandem Ciders, and I will let them introduce themselves, and then we'll start drinking. Yeah, my name is Dan Young uh, from Tandem Ciders. My wife, uh, Nikki Rothwell, and I opened Tandem Ciders in 2008. Um, <clears throat> I'm a transplant to Michigan. My wife grew up there. Um, and I came from a brewing back background with a little bit of a love for cider. And uh, we, my wife and I, and Nikki and I took a bike ride through southern England. Uh, the year before we moved to Michigan, and we ended up, uh, I was looking for breweries and we ended up in Ciderland, and uh, when we ended up moving to Michigan, uh, there's so much fruit up there, and just for a description, you know, everybody says the mitten, you know, the, what's the, where's the whole mitten thing come from, but, you know, there's two parts of Michigan, and they kind of look like hands, and we're at the top of this mitten, so we're in the lower peninsula, and we're up in the northern part. And the fruit growing region is all on that uh, western uh, edge of Michigan, kind of moderated by the lake. But we can go more into that later. That's my story. Yeah. Um, so my name is Dion Stepanski, and um, I own a Presqu'il Farm Cider with my wife Molly. We basically moved home to an old family farm in Alpena area. So it's outside of Alpena, but it's the other side of the state from where Dan is. So we're not actually in the fruits, fruit growing side of the state. Um, we moved um, back from living out west for many years, um, took over this old family farm that wasn't a vegetable farm at the time. It was kind of just an old homestead at that point. Um, but we started an orga organic vegetable farm first and foremost. So we're just in our second year of pressing. Um, we're still buying in most of our apples, have planted an orchard, but we're kind of first and foremost an organic vegetable farm. Um, we grow in lots of greenhouses. Our focus is lettuce. We're lettuce farmers. So um, we're new to, new to apples, you know, growing apples is definitely different than, than growing lettuce. Um, so all of our fruit is purchased right now from the western side of the state, um, right, around, uh, right around Dan's farm, actually, or Dan's uh, uh, cidery. And um, then this year we will get into difficulties of cider fruit. Um, but this year we couldn't get any fruit from the farmer we got it from last year. And so we did source some, like most of our fruit this year is from Grand Rapids area. So that's like more more commercial, uh, huge commercial um, apple, apple area. So fortunately this, for this panel, all the, all the apples that I have um, in this, this cider is from the tip of the mint. Okay. Um, but but we, yeah. Um, and then I'm just, so I'm just going to, because Brian Ulrich is not here, Ulrich is not here, I will just read, he sent me some stuff, so I'm going to read his spiels. Um, Left Foot Charlie is a small winery and cidery in Traverse City, which, as I understand, is, oh, like top top, right? Uh, not quite on the very top. We're in this, like, little nook here, okay. right by the pinky. Um, they started in 2004, focusing on white wines. They began producing hard cider in 2008. Currently, they make about 25,000 gallons of cider, all from apples grown on specific farms in their area. And they work directly with five farms, and they use a belt press. So, let's drink. Yeah. Um, okay, the first one, Dan is gonna talk about his Ernest. Um, Ernest is the <clears throat> first, one of our first ciders that we made with all, uh, um, or not, you know, not completely all, but a lot of true cider varieties. You know, we opened up in 2008, and 
uh, we really were crowing about, you know, hey, we need cider specific fruit. We can't make cider from these, you know, regular apples. And <clears throat> we ended up making a lot of cider from regular apples. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, our, our flagship is uh, Smackintosh, which is mostly Macintosh apples. Our other best seller is uh, the Green Man, which is mostly Rhode Island greening. But this is our first uh, foray. We had uh, some growers who really uh, took to growing uh, cider-specific fruit. And this is um, uh, three farms kind of combined. We have um, a base of Rhode Island greening from uh, the tip of Old Mission Peninsula, which is another little peninsula that sticks out into Lake Michigan. Um, and then the uh, other uh, fruit is from um, the Watkowski Farm, which is uh, at the base of our county, and then also uh, Kevin Verschneider, who grows along the shores of Lake Leelanau. And it's pretty interesting. So we, this is a tandem's take on this is, you know, we've always been like super clean uh, fermentation. We ferment all in stainless steel. Uh, we use, uh, you know, Red Star Cote de Blanc at a cold, you know, pretty cold temperature. And then we tend to stop the fermentation. We have a centrifuge. So uh, we whip everything through that centrifuge and take out all the yeast. So everything's like super clean, uh, I think, and pretty fresh. And then I think it's interesting because uh, Dean's uh, site of the farmhouse is again a bunch of apples from those uh, one of those same same farms. Yeah. And uh, your take on fermentation is a little bit different. Yeah. So the farmhouse then, um, if we're gonna just bounce around the the farmhouse, um, the majority of the apples, I guess I shouldn't say majority. I guess about two thirds of the apples are from. The Watkowski farm that he was talking about, um, and then the rest of them are literally from like right around the corner from his cidery. Um, so very same, uh, similar area, but our approach to fermentation is quite a bit different. We let everything ferment wild and spontaneously first and really only pitch yeast if there's problem. Um, so if fermentation doesn't take off, then we'll pitch. Um, but. You know, we also do focus on um, only stainless steel or barrels. Um, this year, just because we were of capacity reasons, we did ferment in some totes, um, or one tote for the first time, but then pulled everything right out. Um, and that's just our, our preference is to stay away from, uh, away from the totes, but um, yeah. And then scale-wise, I think is important, is we're just, we're tiny. So this farmhouse was the, the the largest cider that we that we released this year, and we did like a hundred cases of it. So, um, very very small. So just to let you guys know, in terms of a like a sensory and tasting perspective, I hadn't tasted any of these before I set the lineup. So I do have them going from what I was, you know, I checked in with these guys. What's your profile? To go from, you know, clean dry to sort of the funky. So. I was fascinated to find out that the apples are from similar areas, and so that's why we wanted to bounce back and forth a little bit. These are great. I like the earnest. It's got a nice, um, the acidity is, is nice and bright in the nose, and you can still catch some of the same aromas in the nose on the um, farmhouse, too. Okay, so number two is the Porter's Perfection from Left Foot Charlie. Um, and what he said about this is this, uh, so the... The reason we're sad that Brian Olbrich isn't here, Rick isn't here, is that he um, he knows a lot about the soils. And then Dan was saying that so does Nikki. <laughs> so we're um, we're gonna do the best that we can. And also everybody wanted to share information. So if you guys are feeling like you'd like more, um, again, put your emails down or, or get in touch with us. Um, so the. The soil matrix, he says, is the result of glacial tilling, which formed the Great Lakes in general, uh, and gave the this upper area a wide variety of indiscriminately placed soil types throughout the region. Just off the Antrim Shale formation, this contributes pockets of clay among the sand and loam. Limestone, granite, and ancient fossilized seabeds were broken up and mixed in by the glacier as well, resulting in loose, draining alluvial soils from epochs long gone. The orchard on both sides sits on loamy knolls overlooking... Lake Michigan. Okay, I was like, oh, and there's like no <laughs> punctuation. Um, the trees are on dwarf root stock, but he forgot specifically which ones. About the Porter's Perfection. Uh, Eagle Ridge Farm in Grand Traverse County uh, is where these were grown. This farm is about eight miles south of the Antrim Farm with a similar soil composition. 
particular site is predominantly sand, a little loam. Uh, and the A horizon, the higher loam and the clay lying in bands beneath, starting at a depth of about six to eight feet on average. It's planted in a slender spindle trellis design. This was part of an experiment that was planted in 2010 to see which bittersweet and bitter sharp apples could thrive in northern Michigan. Um, most of you guys probably know that up until around that time, Michigan was mostly working with uh, dessert fruit, so this was newer. There were 600 trees and about 15 varieties. Porter's is a consistent producer from this site with even crops since 2016. They began isolating it as a single varietal cider in 2019. Uh, it's also used in some blends like their Eagle's Ransom, which is in the Michigan draft trailer over in the hall. And uh, he says, based on this block, I would recommend more plantings of the variety and has tremendous blending potential. It blends very well with, Ida, with varieties like Ida Red, Jonathan Winesap Empire, can add depth and body to these traditional Michigan varieties. And he says, while it's not his goal to move away entirely from the heritage of snappy, bright acidity, these tannic varieties can help expand the potential for diversity in both the orchard and the cidery. He says he's not convinced that the um, slender spindle system is the best way to go. Verdict is still out, but it seems to be okay for Porter's perfection. Um, he's not sure about the long-term prospects, though, for the tree health and the vitality. And so this Porter's perfection, he says the sugar at harvest was uh, 16 bricks. They fermented it with fresco yeast from Renaissance. And on this one, the final pH is 3.4 and it's 7.9%, and this was uh, bottle conditioned. Cheers. So just a, a comment about Porter's Perfection for us. Um, we haven't ever used the apple, but um, from a growing perspective, it's the tree that we've actually planted the most of. Um, so we just started our first plantings about four years ago, and in that planting, we just planted a bunch of different varieties. Um, and the Porter's Perfection just like took off. So in contrast, like Kingston is just doing horrible. There's still just like whips that like won't grow. Um, and Porter's Perfection are the, the most beautiful, biggest trees. So we're actually really excited about the potential for growing that tree actually. Yeah. And I am a total are. sucker yeah. for tannins. So I really love this. These are, these are some pretty strong tannins though. They are, they're not gentle. Um, but I think as a, a blending opportunity, this, but this is, pretty impressive as a single varietal. That's good. So, what do you guys think about this? Yay, Porter's Perfection? All right. Okay, go Crabster. Uh, Crabster. <clears throat> um, Crabster, we started, um, we started making Crabster when we first opened as a blend of wild uh, foraged apples. You know, we had time back then to like drive around and pick apples. What? Um, and, <laughs> and now it seems ridiculous. Uh, um, but now we've uh, moved into, um, you know, domestic crabs, crabs that are used as uh, pollinizers. Uh, and also, um, in this particular one, there's some uh, cider-specific fruit that came from uh, the Versnyder farm as well. So it's um, about half greenings. We use greenings a lot. Um, and then the kind of rosy color comes from a, a crab apple. We used to uh, pick a Macintosh from a block of apples, and they had as pollinizers these um, red-fleshed crab apples that the no one knew what they were. The uh, growers like, I don't know, we put that orchard in the 70s and they just didn't remember. So uh, they tore that orchard up and right before they did, the guy that was actually doing the tearing up, uh, he didn't tear out any of the pollinizers. He left them there. And our production guys, uh, Rich and, and his brother Dave, we went there with a truck and actually yanked trees out of the ground with a truck and replanted them. And uh, since then we've grafted the apples and we've kind of saved it. We don't know what the variety is, but it has an awesome uh, bit of a reddish color. That's the story of the grabster. And again, clean fermentation. And um, I'm always surprised just by how kind of like a little bit of a snappy apple flavor it still has. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's like you know, half percent residual sugar, I think. Mm -hmm. It's got a nice roundness to it. Ooh. Acid hangs on in this one. You can still feel it. Is this fat sweetened at all? Uh, no. We stopped the uh, fermentation with the uh, uh, centrifuge. And this one pretty much, uh, we let this one go all the way to completion. It's still about 
um, like you know, 0.5 residual sugar in there. They just wouldn't wouldn't finish fermenting. Uh, but we did centrifuge this one as well. All right. I'll take a look at number four, which is Antrim County, again from Left with Charlie. Um, this one is uh, Antrim County Hard Cider. It's 50% Rhode Island Greening and 50% Jonathan. This is from Bowles Farm in Antrim County. Uh, it's about 130 acres of rolling hills with a creek and woods and about 80 ac acres of cherries and apples. And uh, these trees they planted in the late 80s. This juice, he said, had been frozen because of um, spatial necessities, and they fully thawed it to 11.5 bricks, fermented it with the Brio yeast from Renaissance uh, at 58 degrees Fahrenheit, on average, he says. It, um, at around four bricks on the hydrometer, they chilled the tank to 40 degrees to halt the fermentation. So this one does have about a 3% residual sugar. Uh, pH on this one is 3.36. 5% alcohol. This one uh, has been sterile filtered and slightly carbonated, which you can definitely see. Um, and they say they make about 2,000 gallons per year of this, and this one retails at about four bucks a gallon. So that's, sorry, four dollars a, a bottle. I'm sorry. Never mind. Look, I already had three. Eight dollars a bottle. Okay, eight dollars a bottle. Sorry. All right, now I'm gonna drink some more. And the uh, the fifty percent greenings that are in the is in the Crabster that came from the same farm as the Antrim County that Ron Bowles um, has a big block of greenings. Um, that's the thing we you know. With, like we, we we're looking for cider specific apples, and I said we spent uh, we, we you know we based one of our ciders on uh, these Rhode Island greenings, and now uh, guys are trying to figure out if they should even keep them in the ground. It's not worth it sometimes for them to keep them planted. So now it's our thing, it's like, oh, well, no, it is. Like, we're willing to pay you uh, a decent price. And Ron's been really great to work with. He's an old guy, and uh, he's uh, a great grower, for sure. And uh, yeah, Brian gets a bunch of apples from him, and uh, we've been really tapping to him as well. And he had no fruit this year. He had the same um, thing. Yeah, we had a frost, oh. kind of frost out in May. Tell us about Farmhouse. We talked a little bit about it, but I guess I didn't get into um, the apple varieties so they are from that same farm um, and then there's actually some wild apples from northeast michigan as well so we were we're still collecting some wild um, literally seedling wild orchards um, but this is a 46 uh, 46 percent uh, kingston black 20 percent northern spy 10 percent balmers norman about eight or ten percent brown snout some Ida Reds, and then a small amount of Romes, and then wild apples. So the wild apples are where the acidity is coming from. Just again, scale perspective, they produce 2,000 gallons of the Antrim. So last year we produced 2,000 gallons total, um, and we doubled our volume this year, but I mean, still totally small, tiny scale. Um, and that's, that's the plan, is to kind of stay that way. Um, so we do focus, you know, our farmhouse, is still like heavy, heavy on bittersweet and bitter sharps. Um, trying to just, you know, fit that little niche in the in the market of staying staying really focused in a on a on a very cider specific apples mostly. We I mean we don't put anything else in. Ferment everything dry at this point too. Are you guys in general in the room? Uh, are a lot of you familiar with bittersweet and bitter sharp apples? Raise your hands if that seems like a okay. So you guys know that a lot of the aroma profiles that are coming out of here and some of the flavor stuff is not because of the wild ferment, but a lot of it, like a lot of those nice, like leathery, yeah, dried yeah. leaves and all that, that's a lot from the um, the bittersweet apples that he's got in there. The acidity that is coming through, um, it seems to be uh, growing as the bottle ages. And I think it is coming from that, the wild apples that are coming through there. Um, just because in our trials we've done some just straight wild fruit and we are really excited about those those apples and have grafted um, several of those wild crabs um, and are trying to you know like you said figure out what what trees um, are going to do really well so a, a, you know a wild tree that's thriving might be a good option um, to to cultivate that into a cider a apple for our area so I kind of like seeking out apples the acid from these wild crabs especially they're a 
excellent source of acidity <laughs> that <laughs> always seems to just like sing through and you don't need very much of it. A question came in here for Dion asking if the Presque Isle Farm ciders all go through a process known as malolactic fermentation, or what is also called MLF for short. And malolactic fermentation is a process where malic acids are converted to lactic acids. And people do this for a variety of reasons. I think primarily I see it as a matter of taste. Folks who don't really want those really sour flavors of cider, and sometimes you want to, depending on the style you're making, want to soften that, and that's the process of going to a lactic acid, which is much smoother and sometimes can be a little like buttery uh, in, in the finished profile. But, um, you know, again, it's a matter of taste. So let's hear what he has to say about that. Yeah, most most of the time, unless for some reason we like we really like something, we'll we'll try to stop it. It's the nature of everything being in barrels. Um, we just yeah, we let it happen. Next question came in from the audience about growing apples in northern Michigan, which can get very cold, and how the cold climate there can play into what the person called sugar assimilation in the apples. So they're talking about. How much sugar do you get in the apples versus like a dry farmed area such as like the Watsonville, California area, which is really dry farming of apples? And how does that affect the sugar content in the apples, which then will really majorly impact the profile of the finished cider? And Dan Young replies to that question. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. There's definitely years... Uh, where the, you know, we just don't have the bricks, the solid bricks. Uh, and it's just, yeah, the season's relatively short where we, where we were from. Uh, we have, yeah, excellent summers, but they end, they end pretty fast. So there are varieties that won't ripen up, uh, up by us. Um, I know like a gold rush is a big, uh, you know, apple that people really like, but we just can't grow it uh, near us. Wine saps, we can't grow at all. But I think that, you know, speaking to that acidity, that is, I think, uh, a Michigan uh, cider quality uh, is that brightness, sharp acidity. I think it comes from the dessert fruit that we use uh, for sure, as a lot of us as a base. When we first started, we used a lot of crab apples, but... Uh, you know, in, in our, like, you know, Smackintosh and Green Man, I mean, that, that Macintosh has plenty of acidity early in the season, for sure. Very rarely do we have problems with acidity with our ciders. Dion had mentioned that the acidity, as it aged, became more prominent in his ciders. And the question asked from the audience was, what did it taste like initially? Um, so I don't think it, the acidity levels are increasing. I'm just noticing that it um, it's coming through a little bit more. And the and the character that was coming out earlier was all the like those bittersweet the bittersweet character of that that Kingston, which we'll get to the next one, was is really intense. These like bittersweet candy, um, leathery, tobaccoy, sometimes like smoky character was it was almost a rounder profile. Now it's kind of like refining, and and I'm noticing, you know, I taste the thing all the time, and have you know, and very close to the cider, but I'm noticing that that acidity is peeking through, and I'm recognizing it in comparison to some of our trial stuff that was non-commercial cider, that was just all wild apples. I'm noticing a compare a a, a, a similarity of that specific type of acid that seems to be kind of peeking through. This cider's uh, from last year's pressing. So, I mean, it's a little over a year, and maybe we're finding that with that blend, the, the peak time was like 10 to 13 months or something, but we'll see. Your ciders are aged in barrel. What kind of barrels do you use? We try to, on all of our labels, we're, we're pretty um, transparent, and so, there's French oak barrels in this cider, but they'd be they'd be like neutral neutral wine barrels. If it's a bourbon or an oak barrel that's going to be imparting something heavy, we'll we'll label that as well. But these this was a neutral neutral wine barrel. And Dan, how about you? Uh, we typically use American oak. Uh, we send it through a couple of uh, stages of fermentation before we start aging in barrels, for sure. Um, and just to kind of clean it out, you know, that like really sharp tannic oakiness is gone. 
And um, so Brian didn't write it in his notes. Do you guys know about his stuff? Not sure. He is a big uh, user of barrels, some gigantic oak barrels that I can't remember the name of. I mean, like big, he has some really big, you know, those... Fooders? Um, fooders, maybe they're called. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, so for me, I'm not getting anything, like none of these taste like newer oak to me. Just out of curiosity, I know in the winemaking world, American oak is not necessarily so prized because it can give off some of those like tropical flavors to the wine. For sure. You find that with your ciders. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can definitely catch some of that. Uh, we use a lot of oak. We make a pomo that we use at American Oak for, and I'm okay with those flavors uh, coming through with that. And, you know, I think we're you know we're trying to make an American product, so that's why we went for the American Oak. And, and uh, there was a, a winemaker in Michigan that really sold me on those barrels. They're made from uh, oak, uh, usually aged like 36 months from Missouri, Missouri. <laughs> Um, but he was a big, uh, but he, you know, he really pushed those as a, as a winemaker. So I said, well, if he's using them, I, I'm okay with that. And I think that's where we started using those oak barrels from. Now, how long are you aging in there? Uh, for the, that Pomo, we try to, uh, we're up to about uh, three and a half years now. We're trying to get to like five years before we sell it, but it's hard to do that. Um. <laughs> And you're talking about mostly new American oak for that? Yes, yep, yep. All new American oak? Uh, all new American oak. Uh, you know, we've dabbled with uh, uh, certainly like bourbon. There's a bunch of distilleries up in our neighborhood. Um, and so we've dabbled with, uh, you know, aging uh, cider in, in different barrels for sure. Uh, but those have been like one-off things we've done in our tasting room. Uh, but you have rum barrels and, uh, what's it, like mammoth? Excuse me? You're going to need char. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, we, use, we usually get like a medium toast on those. Yes, we we played around for a few years on different, you know, toasts on those barrels, but I think in the end we just like, you know, the medium toast. And again, we do a couple of rounds of ferments. Those ciders we can, you know, sell in our tasting room, you know, it's kind of one-off, you know, super oaky things, uh, but before we age the pomo in those barrels. Barrel aging ciders is always a hot topic as more and more cider makers are slowly moving towards that trend. And it takes, well, it takes a lot of practice to learn how to barrel age ciders for sure. So Dion is being asked here, what is the length of time that Presque Isle Farm barrel ages their ciders? So we'll ferment in all the barrels and then it basically stays in the barrel until it's, and until it's bottled. So, I mean, we start bottling, um, there's some stuff that's great right now, so we're actually maybe even next week gonna pull a few things out that taste really good and they're ready to go. But we actually don't rack off the lees in any of our barrels either. We continue to, we use bot botanage and mix everything back in. Um, Try to be a little bit, uh, little bit more on top of things and do things more commercially this year and like rack some of our tanks, our stainless tanks, like right away when I'm supposed to and ended up with problems in the ciders that I'm like racking. So I don't know, I, I think that I'm leaving stuff on Lee's is a, is a mixed bag. It's worked really well for us, as long as you keep putting it back into solution for us, but it's kind of frustrating when you try to, try to do things and be a little bit more proactive and then cause problems because of it. All right, use that to segue into the Kingston yep. Black. So Kingston Black, this is a, 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 a blend of two different barrels and then uh, one stainless tank. Um, and the stainless tank, we did pitch yeast in. Um, the barrels were again, uh, uh, neutral French oak barrels. And the barrels were both wild fermented. Um, we don't, uh, don't filter anything. In July, I bottled some up off of, um, just to take and drink, but it actually wasn't finished um, in July. So, so sitting in our cellar at 50 degrees, it kind of continued on and, and, and we just really had to keep waiting and waiting. So we haven't really sold much of this yet because uh, we, we didn't bottle it that long ago. It took almost a, a year to finish, but it was still moving. So we just waited and waited. We want to just sulfite a little bit right at bottling, but we do actually use a, um, we'll go into a bright tank. So we're not bottle conditioning. Um, so that's a little bit different. Um, I just like, since, since we're 
going wild with so much stuff and leaving so much up in the air that uh, at bottling, um, I kind of like the the control of um, still really light carbonation too. I don't I don't I don't think the bitter sweets and bitter sharps they can get really overpowered if the carbonation is too high and that can happen pretty easily with bottle condition stuff. So I like the mellow carbonation. Um, but this is beautiful. I, I, this is probably my favorite cider of ours right now. It just turned out splendidly. Yeah. Um, I like the smokiness. The um, that's my my favorite uh, type of cider. Is to those those phenolics and yeah. I like this because um, one of the things that I like out of Kingston Black is sometimes it throws sort of this like candied or caramel orange kind of flavor, and this is one of the few ones that I've had it in. Um, so we were talking about a little bit of regional diversity in some of the single varietals, and it's something I haven't picked up in the, a lot of the West Coast Kingston Blacks, um, and not all of, you know, sort of the Northeast ones. Uh, you know, you talked a little bit about how Michigan's growing conditions influence the apples that you get there and, you know, some of your cider making choices. To me, this represents a really different idea of what I had been tasting in Michigan like 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, do you guys still feel like you were talking about sort of that, you know, snappy acid, uh, bright, clean Michigan stuff. Do you guys feel like Michigan has a sort of regional distinction? And do you feel like you're top of the mitten? I mean, part of the reason everybody's interested in that latitude, right, is because it's where you grow great wines in, in France. And so right. do you guys feel like your top versus the rest of the mitten is different and how would you you know is there a regional thing or do you think there's enough shifting and change now going on that that's less viable or less it seems to yeah, me you've got think, more variability than you used to which i think is fantastic um yeah i think i think certainly up uh the top of the mitten by us in the past 10 years has been a, a Big explosion. So we, yeah, we have kind of lost that like Michigan flavor of uh, you know winemaker influenced, you know clean, high acid, fruity cider. There's just different people entering the market. I mean, you know, Dean has started and taking a whole different approach than that. I know there's uh, you know a dozen cider cideries up by us now um, in, our, in our region that are all kind of taking a different take on it, and and it's. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a lot more uh, diversification of flavor and exploration and, and just, you know, people's takes on how they're going to make cider. And it's exciting because we have a whole new, uh, you know, we have a bunch, bunch of apples that are coming available to us that, you know, we just haven't had for all, ever, you know, so now it's like we get to experiment with these. It's exciting. Uh, it's an exciting time. So I would definitely make a pitch just as like a tourist pitch if you ever... Uh, in Michigan, uh, certainly Glint Cap is worth uh, checking out. Uh, the Great Lakes International Cider and Perry Competition, awesome uh, place to meet and hang out with uh, so a fellow cider aficionados. Uh, they have a great training program for uh, cider uh, judging and stewarding. Um, and then when you're in that neighborhood, there's uh, uh, it's a just quick hop, and a hop, skip, and a jump to come up and see us up up north. So can everybody give a thanks to our volunteers and to the panel? This pre-recorded workshop from CiderCon 2022 once again was titled Top of the Mitten. Again, the moderator was Nicole Laban, and you heard from Dan Stepanski of Presque Isle Farm, Dan Young of Tandem Ciders, and also Ciders Tasted from Left Foot Charlie, all Michigan-based cideries. And as Dan said, there's a lot going on there. In fact, Cider Chat has a number of episodes from Michigan cideries, and most recently had a recording with Patrick McCauley, all on cider mills down in the Ann Arbor region of Michigan, and there's amazing history. So I will be putting links in the show notes for this year, episode 314, so you could check out some of those Michigan cideries that are still in operation. And having been to the area known as the Ridge during Apple Blossom, I'll tell you, it was just absolutely breathtaking. 
so I hope soon you might be headed to Michigan to check out their ciders. And to follow up on my earlier statement on what cider I walked out of that workshop with and actually wanted to kind of grab as many bottles as I could, but they're already all poured. Well, that was the farmhouse cider from Presque Isle Farm. It was just smooth as, uh, well, a baby's behind. (laughs) What can I say? I do have a tendency to go for ciders that, that go through malolactic fermentation. So that's just my preference. But that doesn't mean it's the only way to roll. And of course, Left Foot Charlie and Tandem Cider had excellent ciders too. But yeah, that farmhouse cider just was mm, the cat's meow. Coming up in June, don't forget, I'll be recording an episode with a tech from Fermentis All on Yeast. And in this here episode, you heard from two makers using two different types of yeast. For Tandem Cider, they're using a a yeast that I typically think of as a wine yeast, and that is Cote de Blanc. Presque Isle Farm is doing primarily natural fermentation, so they're using the wild ambient yeast. So there's a lot of different directions you can go, and if you are puzzled or you have a question about that, do send those questions my way to info at ciderchat.com. This coming September 18th through the 24th, there is a Totally Cider Tour headed to Normandy and Brittany. And you could see some of the makers that we will be hanging out with and having dinner with, too, to boot, which is a very intimate experience. And I'll tell you, I didn't really know if I was going to be doing any more Totally Cider Tours. I mean, you know, the pandemic was tough on all of us. And in fact, things have changed. One of the makers I was hoping to go see Well, the cidery has now been sold. So that means all the product moving forward is going to be totally different because that's how life moves. So anyone that was on a past tour to France with me, we had a moment in time to be able to taste a very magical Calvados that will never be the same. I mean, it just changes. And that is how life moves along. And that is one thing that I think we have all learned during these past two years is to not put off not to put off our dreams, but to live them today because we never know if tomorrow's going to come. And, you know, it's been a tough lesson for sure, but it has allowed me and I hope allowed you to continue to live each day fully and to fulfill your dreams and not put off your dreams for another day because that day again may not come. Anywho, Without further ado, let me just encourage you to go check out the Totally Cider page at ciderchat.com and you'll be able to see a listing of the makers from past episodes that I've had on the podcast, some of which we will be visiting on this tour. I, I, I just cannot wait to see these folks and I know that they can't wait to see all of us heading there September 18th through the 24th. Send an email my way if you're interested in going along, and soon this tour will be released to the public. A big tip of the glass to all the fine folks who support this podcast monthly through the Cider Chat Patreon page. You too can become a patron by going to the Cider Chat Patreon page, which is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And with that, I leave you here. This is Rio Wind Caller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards and having fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We like palms. We like orchards. Having some fun, there is a reason. 
There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh yeah. We we like cider. Oh yes, we do. We Like palms. Oh yes, we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh yeah. We like cider. We like palm. Oh yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeah.